Welcome to the second day of the fragmentation training school uh, in biomedical analysis. So today uh, we have the pleasure to have with us uh, Professor Carol Gobl from uh, University of Manchester, uh, Christian Tischer from EMBL Heidelberg, uh, David Rousseau from Université Angers, and uh, Ignacio Arganda Carreras from University of uh, Del País Vasco. Okay, so hello everybody, and I can't really um, see you very well if I'm also showing my screen, so um, I'm just going to put some of you at the bottom of the screen. Um, in the chat, I've put a, a link to the slides, uh, so you can kind of read along, and um, I've also put in a couple of other links to pages in the Research Data Management Toolkit, and also videos around metadata associated with bioimaging um, data management, uh, because I know you're, a lot of you are bioimaging people. And so that's a bonus that I've just uh, given you uh, there as well. So what I'm going to talk about today is fair computational workflows. And uh, I, as I said, Stuart will be helping me. And we both represent Workflow Hub, which is a, a workflow um, registry environment um, which represents the workflow collaboratory work that's been done in the EOSC Life project. And this is all training associated with the EOSC Life project. And I'm also um, highlighting here contributions from other members of the club. Lots of projects have contributed to this. A workflow is this a, a way of being able to chain together, it's effectively a pipeline or some sort of multi-step computational analysis that links together multiple steps. And those steps could be uh, tools or command line um, tools or even calls to containers or, or other workflows. And you have some inputs and you have some outputs. The key thing that separates out a workflow from just normal regular software is that it has an abstraction and composition properties. So it has the notion of a workflow. So there's an abstraction a specification of the of the different steps often presented as a graphical format but it could be a yaml file or it could be some other um format that is used in order to be able to describe the uh the steps and then there is some sort of software execution engine some workflow management engine behind it that will take on that specification and handle all of the pieces to do with access to the computational infrastructure to do with supporting tool interoperability and portability and all that kind of thing. And the idea is to make it kind of to provide an abstraction layer over the analytics in order to be able to get some sort of implementation independence. Now, we'll see in a minute, it's not always like straightforward as that, but that's roughly what a workflow is. And it also, the second property of a workflow system and a workflow is that it's really designed around composition, that we have these steps and these steps can be put into a workflows, then could be used in other workflows. And these steps will be heterogeneous. They could be different codes or different languages or from different third parties. And so the notion of compositionality and abstraction is really underlying the whole principle of computational workflows. But they come in many different shapes and sizes. So some of you will be using Jupyter Notebooks and in some senses, an interactive electronic notebook, uh, the Colab or, or um, Jupyter Notebooks are kind of workflows in the sense that you have through a convention, a series of steps that you might be executing through. I say by convention because actually it doesn't force the ordering of, the, of those steps. Um, other environments you'll almost certainly be familiar with are things like scripting environments and scripts are kind of in some senses a workflow although often that abstraction piece and that composition piece isn't highlighted so much because scripts often sort of muddle up uh, the kind of the implementation of it for, of the steps from the abstraction of the of the series of steps that you want Whereas workflow management systems and their associated execution platforms uh, really try to do this kind of separation of providing an environment for you to be able to manage those, those steps um, and to have this abstraction layer. And there's lots of them. Uh, there's about currently at the moment uh, uh, known to us 320 of these. 
some of which you'll know, Snake Make, Next Flow, Galaxy, some of you uh, may have come across these. And associated with um, this are the um, repositories where you might find workflows being managed and developed by various different communities. So for example, in Nextflow, there's the NF Core community in bioinformatics. In SnakeMake, there's the SnakeMake catalog community. Um, and then there's registries um, that enable you to register those workflows so that they can be found. Um, and also one can deposit workflows in the general repositories. And we'll go into that a little bit later on. So you can see it's kind of an interesting environment. So each of these workflows have different communities and characteristics. Snake make is a kind of graph of jobs. Um, it's like make uh, with Python. Um, Galaxy, on the other hand, is completely the other end. It's like an online portal where uh, folks are building and reusing workflows around um, that are already available or uh, through up, pre-uploaded uh, wrapped and pre-installed tools. And it's much more orientated to people managing that place and making workflows available to others, um, whereas SnakeMake is much more about doing some sort of um, uh, uh, sort of uh, almost like a bake file for my uh, for uh, my analysis. And Next Tower, uh, Next Flow, and Next Tower, uh, like a full, it's a fully fledged kind of programming environment uh, for uh, computational pipelines. And these are, I would say, these are the three most popular workflow systems that we see in bioinformatics right now. These three are really the, the kind of leaders in the field and open source. There's also things like Nine, but that's not, that's partly open source. And really these workflows are used for interactive and exploratory analysis with human in the loop and also production and automated uh, approaches as well, pipelines uh, really, as well as things like tool chaining, batch processing, and job control. So there's, there's an entire galaxy, as it were, of workflows. So how do you choose which one? Well, uh, based on the specifics of its data types and its codes and the, and the kinds of workflow that you want to use. Are you trying to do simulations? Are you trying to use HPC? Are you trying to, uh, is, it, is it a sort of chaining tools or is it doing job control? What kind of things are you trying to do? Uh, and we won't get into the details of that uh, because that's all to do with workflow craftsmanship rather than fair workflows. Um, what's the skills level of the workflow developer? So if you're not very skilled, you want a, a platform that you can just is basically you pick out steps you want to do and you build the steps through a graphical environment, perhaps like Galaxy. Um, um, and but the main thing is how popular is it? Um, is there a community of practice that does what I want? Um, are there reference workflows I can use? And is there good documentation and support? It's so basically you use the one that everybody else uses, uh, more or less. And uh, there are many different, um, uh, uh, different kinds of users of workflows, and this is going to affect the FAIR piece. Okay, so there's um, many different uh, stakeholders, shall we say, in, in workflow environments from people who develop tools that go into the workflows, which need to be wrapped and maintained so that it can be executed by these workflow systems. Um, those who actually build workflows that have to be developed and run and maintained. And those who might then use the workflows that have been built that need to be understood and explained. And, and of course, there's a lot of labor and the labor diminishes as you go along this kind of stakeholder space, but the reach of who you can affect increases as you, you know because one person can make a workflow that many people can use um, if they can find it that is which is what fair is all about fair stands for findable accessible interoperable reusable i'm usually assumed by now most people have heard of it but i'm still often surprised that some people haven't this is a huge principle of um, science and research data and increasingly software um, across the entire scientific community. It's really a meme. It's nothing new. It's just, how do I find things? How do I make sure I can get hold of things? How do I make sure I can link them to other things? And how can I reuse it? Um, so it's it's really not uh, um, hugely novel, but the word is very cool. So this is the first time we've managed to get um, this principle sort uh, kind of really uh, noticed. 
Uh, hardly anybody has read the paper, by the way. <laughs> but, uh, this paper is now cited nearly 8,000 times. It did my H index no harm at all. Uh, but, but, um, but most people have never read it, right? And this is actually what the principles are. They're about, um, for data anyway, they're about signing unique identifiers to things, describing things with metadata, um, being able to access things through a standard protocol, um, using formal ways of describing. Um, so this is actually what the FAIR data principles are about. But what does that mean in practice uh, for workflows? And in practice, what fair, work, uh, FAIR principles mean for workflows is, can I find some of these already existing workflows of which you have just spoken, Carol? Um, can I make mine findable? If I, can I access them? Where's the Git repository? What's the license? What language is it written in? What tools does it use? Do I have permission to rework it? Is it feasible to rework it? Is it well enough described so I can understand it and use it? How much description do I need to so somebody else can use my workflow? Always assuming that you want to share them, of course. Uh, how are updates and versions managed, which of course doesn't necessarily apply very much to data because the data is normally considered to be fairly static, but we're talking about workflows and workflows are a form of software as we'll shortly see. Can I use it? Um, am I allowed to use it? Can I run? Can I run it in my infrastructure? Is it portable? You know, can I test? Is it comparable to others? And also, as a process, as a piece of software that is effectively doing a data flow, most of these they have a control flow associated with them. How do I control the execution of the steps? But they have a data flow associated with them, which is data flows from one step to the next. So as it's um, flowing, is that data that is flowing and being derived and created by the workflow, is that fair? And are there best practices to make sure? Um, and also, how do I start using workflows? But will I also get credit for uh, my workflow? And can, and can I track that credit? So this is also all, all kind of tied up in fair workflows in practice. So if we go back to what those fair data principles were, um, Actually, what they were all about was about enabling automation. It, they were actually devised so that effectively you would have machine actionable metadata associated with data so that you could then ex use that data and be able to have workflows be able to use it. So because you would be able to actually interpret the metadata associated with the data. That was actually the... Uh, the real underpinning of all of this. But this is what it basically comes down to. Persistent identifiers, register things, enable automation. It's got nothing to do at all about data quality or reproducibility or credit, the fair data principles. That's extra on top of this, actually. So when we go back to workflows, okay, so how does this all apply to workflows? Well, remember I said that workflows have some sort of abstraction. They have some sort of specification description. Could be a graph, it could be um, a YAML file, it could be in, in, in some sort of JSON, some sort of description associated with them, which also includes things like the inputs and outputs and the parameters that you'll be uh, putting into that workflow, um, some configuration information. And then it has this execution piece, which is the actual engine itself, which is going to manage all of the calling and, and using the computational infrastructure that you're using, as well as the codes that you'll be executing, the steps that you'll be executing um, and potentially containers. And then it has many associated objects. For example, the resultant data, associated test data, sample data, uh, maybe uh, other workflows that will check whether this workflow is producing the correct data. So you have kind of checker workflows uh, to make sure that we're, it, nothing's particularly changed so that we can check that the results are correct still, that the workflow is still in good shape because workflows are effectively software. So what we have here is the description is kind of like a description of a fair method. Um, so it's like a data object really. And the, and the actual, uh, so, but it's actually software. The workflows are actually software with data going in and out, 
and some associated services. So they're actually a hybrid objects. They're both software and often interpreted as a sort of data description of method as well. So this means when we're talking about fair principles for workflows, we're talking about three different things. We're talking about them as method objects, right? That describe what are you going to be doing, the steps that you're doing. Um, and so we can use the fair data principles for that. Um, they're software. So they have issues to do with, are they usable and reproducible or maintainable? And here, there's a whole new set of principles called the fair for research software principles. These don't just apply to workflows, this applies to all software. Okay, these are hot off the press. Okay, and, um, and then we've got the, these are really instruments for the data flow, the flow, the data that flows through those, uh, those workflows, through those steps, they have to be fair as well. So we have to be able to support uh, fair data principles as well. So I put handy links here so you can, that's your homework to go and read these, uh, these papers. So that means that um, the principles that we'll be looking at are um, around, so for the abstraction, which is this kind of specification, and I've used here, this is actually a common yeah. workflow language uh, presentation of a, of a workflow here in this picture. Um, the fair data principles apply to, you know, this is an object, okay, because it actually says what you're going to do. So even if you lost the software, you'd still have this description. So you might want to recode it into another workflow language or another workflow system, but at least you've got the instruction of the method. This is the method, um, okay? But, but they're also software because it's going to be living and there's issues to do with stability and uh, you know the lifetime of the software. They're compositional, all those little steps. I don't know if you can see my arrow wandering about. There's modularization and dependencies. Uh, and all the different components may may change. And then there's usability, like you might you might have it, but can you actually use it? So is it actually usable? So to sum up this piece, this is the context piece. What are the uh, fair for research software principles? Well, actually they're basically interpret sort of variations or, or uh, slightly change changes to the data ones. So they look more or less the sort of same. Um, the, the difference is there are some principles that have been extended to finding versions and finding components because software and workflows are versioned, right? Uh, because we have multiple versions and they have components. They have steps, they have libraries, they have things associated with them. So they're extended to that. Interoperability is based on standard APIs and common metadata exchange between the steps. So this basically says for workflows that the metadata that you use, you, know, you have to figure out what the inputs and output steps are from the handoffs of the data from each step and standard APIs associated with that. There's another slight wrinkle to that, which I'll go into later. And um, there's an emphasis in reusability to not just think about is it usable so it can be executed and is it reusable so it can be modified. So there's reusable, I can reuse the software, I can reuse the workflow and adapt it for my needs and it's usable in the sense I can actually run the damn thing, right? But there's still nothing on software quality or credit in the principles, so that's an extra. Okay, so what does that mean in practice? Uh, for me and my colleagues, well, that's the, what we're going to now talk about is some steps towards uh, fair um, workflows by looking at registering workflows, better metadata and best practices to be able to, uh, to try to get these fair principles uh, into our workflows. Okay, findability. Now you're all gonna be making workflows and by the end of this training with Rocco and all of his chums, you're going to have some workflows, um, hopefully. And um, where are they going to be? Where are these workflows going to be? Or you might want to find somebody else's workflows and reuse them because that would be really good if we could do that. We actually reused other people's, uh, you know, carefully designed um, computational um, and analytics, right? 
well, there are all these different places. So how do you find them? They're in community repositories. All these different communities all live in communities, right? They, they all have their own little private gangs, right? Um, and they have their own repositories, usually in a form of GitHub, right? So, but how do you know where they are? Well, telepathy or just by reading papers or something. Um, so, and often people's stuff is just in GitHub, right? Like this one here, or they're in community platforms. So things like uh, Galaxy or Nextflow, they put their uh, workflow, that there's kind of installations of these um, that uh, people can then deposit their workflows in and they execute within these kind of um, very large, um, well, varying degrees sizes of installations with multiple platforms in them so they're like cloud services effectively you find them in publications because people have published some stuff and then they point to them uh, you can find them by using google which is how we all do research isn't it folks and um or you can find them actually in data repositories like zenodo and dataverse and open air uh, but you know that's a bit hit and miss as well uh, and then you, they're just packaged up in zip files and, and deposited. So how do we overcome this very distributed and fragmented and variable world? And, you know, all these silos, you know, so I've written a workflow in, you know, using R, say, and somebody else has written a workflow using some Python platform. And um, how do, you know, they, they could be the same workflow or it, it could have been useful to have used that one, but I didn't know about it. Um, so registries, this is how we kind of try to, to, to solve the problem. And there's two really major registries, DocStore, um, which um, is from the US and very orientated around Docker, as you'd expect from the name, and, and is tied to several US big platforms, execution platforms for executing workflows, and Workflow Hub which is what uh, uh, we've developed in the European Open Science Cloud Life project and what um, Stuart and I uh, uh, are involved in, what we're involved in here. Now, a good idea about a registry is that it gives you one place uh, to go to, which is searchable, okay? It, and we can integrate it with all these different um, repositories that we know about. It has some notion of standardization around the metadata and the way the things are presented. You can cite things if they're registered because it can give it an identifier. Um, we can support interoperability by um, showing different workflows and being able to support what interoperable processes, also interoperable languages, which I'll go on to shortly. But the big thing for FAIR is metadata, right? We really, we can get some metadata associated with our workflows. So we're going to concentrate on Workflow Hub because that's the thing that we use. It's got, you know, two URLs because it came out of EU, but we've also got the org one. This was launched in September 2020, so it's coming up to its second birthday. It's about to go out of beta as a result. Um, and this is sponsored by Elixir, the Research Infrastructure for Life Science Data. And I know you're, you're doing bioimaging. That's uh, Eurobioimaging Research Infrastructure, but we're sisters and friends. It's very much an open development project, so you can join in. Um, it currently has, uh, two, when I did this slide, 273 workflows in it from 12 system types. So the thing about Workflow Hub is it really doesn't care what your workflow system is. So if you've got a fancy, you know, Nextflow workflow, great, let's have that. But if you've got some Python scripts, or you've got some R scripts, okay? I know that we said, you know, there's workflow systems and they have an abstraction, but frankly, we'll take anything. As if it's got multiple steps in it, we'll have it, right? So the notion of it being a pipeline or some sort of multi-step um, processing. We also have um, uh, 106 teams in it, and the teams are interesting. They help towards FAIR as well, because you're cre basically creating a community of practice with uh, uh, over 300 people who have, have um, registered and participating in this. So it's a growing resource. So the thing about it, so how does it help with the, with the FAIR? Okay, 
But system agnostic, you can search for and discover workflows of uh, different kinds across it because it's got this tagging uh, part. Tagging becomes very important, of course. This example is a um, Galaxy workflow, actually, which is showing itself as a native Galaxy figure. That's what Galaxy workflows look like when they're in Galaxy. Um, so you can search for it. You can put you associate the authors with things. You can say what the license is. There's analytics around how many people are using it. You can create versions. This is version one when I took this slide shot. Um, you can see this, uh, this is only tagged with COVID-19 because we set this whole thing up originally just uh, for, for really supporting the COVID piece. We have some metadata standardization uh, things that we've done, um, which I'll go on to briefly later on. We don't worry too much about those. And you can give it a DOI. So you can give it a DOI and so you can cite it. And here at the bottom, I've got uh, a workflow that's been cited. At, at, it's got a DOI associated with it, with the creators, and there's the citation, okay. Um, so that's really um, important. And in fact, we're working with several publishers now in that Workflow Hub will be a recommended registry when you're publishing a paper, which has got a workflow in it, that the workflow is registered in Workflow Hub. And so there's a DOI there and you can add that into your, uh, your paper. We have collections. Um, so of different kinds and particularly uh, one form of collection is a team. Right. So um, workflows are tip can be done as um, as individuals, but normally they're done. It could be just a team of one, um, but typically they're done in labs or with teams of, of people. So we um, we have a team mechanism so you can associate your workflows with a team and that team becomes a community of practice. Uh, really. And communities of practice are really important when you're trying to find things or or do better workflows because you're you're then then you have a place to go to that says, who is doing stuff like I am? What are they doing? And um, we can get together in order to be able to find out, you know, what is the best workflows that, uh, that I could be using or around that particular topic or being done by that particular community. So it's another way of building a community around fair workflows. And, and that includes things like showing permissions. So you can set up, uh, you could set up, um, I'm going to have a team or a space for uh, this defrag bioimaging um, tutorial. And we're gonna create that team and we're going to all be in it and we'll all share our workflows. And it doesn't matter that those workflows may be half baked, who cares? It's uh, because we support um, workflows that are not yet ready to be published. Well, then don't give them a DOI. That's fine. And you can share them just with your team rather than anybody else. So you have sharing permissions. So it's not just um, an open thing. Um, it's so you can get access to them. Remember, FAIR doesn't have O in it. It's access, not open. Right? FAIR is not about being open. It's about being able to access things. And that might be emailing somebody to say, how, how do I get hold of this? We also have ways of, well, we also have accessibility through, um, through the platform itself, Workflow Hub. It, it uses an API called the TRS API, which it comes from the Global Alliance for Genomics and Health uh, standardization community. And that means that you can interoperate it with all sorts of other systems. So for example, if you find a Galaxy workflow on Workflow Hub, you can launch, you can run it on Galaxy um, by pressing the uh, use, on, uh, use on Galaxy uh, button. Um, and also other systems uh, like the Sapporo system from, um, uh, from Japan. But it also cross links to other services. So for example, um, the Life Monitor, workflow system that I'll be uh, briefly saying which um, or system that manages and tests whether your workflows work or not. Um, so this gives you integration with execution platforms using standards and that's useful because one of the things about FAIR is we need to make sure that they actually work, the workflows actually work. Um, now this, the important thing here is it doesn't replace uh, community um, and development repositories, it works with them. 
Um, and that's really important because you can upload a workflow just by filling in, like, uploading some files, or you can connect it to a GitHub. Um, and therefore you're supporting, you can use the GitHub environments, all these different communities, like, you know, the, uh, the Nextflow people will be managing carefully and curating and looking after their workflows there, but then they can register them into Workflow Hub and then everybody can kind of see them, uh, including vers versioning management. So that's really important, right? Uh, because um, we really need to, to support that. And yeah, you can also add documents and test data. And we partner with very high profile systems to really improve things like metadata extraction. Um, so that if you have a workflow that uh, is particularly um, good at, at a workflow management system that surfaces its metadata in the workflow language, then we can, we can scrape that out and help register it into the Workflow Hub. One of the most important things is the citation CFF, CFF um, uh, format for being able to cite software, which I'll briefly mention later on. So there's different ways of getting metadata into, these, uh, into this workflow uh, registrant. I mentioned as well that there's a whole new world of um, standards associated with this. There's um, something called Bioschema, which is uh, a version of schema.org, which is the metadata markup language for the web that's in all your web pages. And that uh, enables you to have a simple way of describing what the workflow is about. Um, there's something called the common workflow language, which is a way of describing the steps of the workflow. Um, uh, in a canonical way. So it doesn't matter which workflow system you're using, there's one way of being able to represent it. And we're trying to move people towards that so that we can do better, richer metadata collection from the different workflow systems. And there's an ontology that types the inputs and outputs of steps, which is the EDAM ontology in biology. And, uh, and then there's a way of packaging all of the stuff you need, all those things I had in the earlier picture, um, into a package called a crate, uh, which is all the metadata and all the companion objects so that you can move it around um, systems. So you'll be able to pass the workflow to say a workflow testing environment or uh, a workflow management system would generate this and pass it on to the, to the hub, which will then unpack it to, to register it in the hub. So this is, this is all this stuff. Now, the good news about this guys is you don't need to know any of this. It's all under the hood, right? So that's the, the, they're just telling you about it so that if you ever see these words pop up, you say, oh yeah, I know all about that. So the bottom line is that using a registry gets you a long way to fare because if you're putting something in a registry, you're giving it a global, unique and persistent identifier. You can get it back from that identifier when we manage all the uh, comms platform to do it. Uh, you're describing it with metadata, um, which you can get hold of. Um, you And uh, you can uh, describe it with many different kinds of uh, metadata. Um, the workflow is licensed. We know where it came from because it came from you when you registered it. Um, and we can check whether it's uh, actually uh, meeting uh, community standards for how it's described. So this gets you, if you just put the workflow in a registry, you get a heck of a long way. Um, and that's why we're going to focus today on just getting you onboarded into a registry because that, you know, all the stuff that you're going to produce, we want to be able to um, help you make sure that's fair. Even if it's just some Python that you've knocked up um, in your homework. Um, a few other things we'll say before we get on to the, uh, the last bit. Oh, well, the, the practical, which is um, um, if you're going to, if you have software and you want it cited, use citation.cff. Who knows about this? So this is a file format that you put into your GitHub and it can be picked up. Well, it'll be picked up in the next release of Workflow Hub, but it'll also get picked up by Zenodo and by Zotoro. And it means then that you're instructing people 
how to cite your software. And if you want some credit for your software, put a citation file in, right? So, uh, so this is, and if somebody else, if you're using somebody else's software, credit them, right? So uh, we need to be able to, to make software a first class uh, research object, right? Not just papers. I'm on a mission to eliminate papers, right? We're going to have software and data, okay? Um, our workflows, and like all our software, actually, is supposed to is is comp, you know supposed to be reusable. And when we're they're composite things, right? You got the steps, and the steps could be command line tools, or they could be um some you know um api driven access to a tool or it could be another workflow or it could be another script right or it could be just some you know script in the workflow itself right but the rules about uh interoperability in the fair research principles for software is are that you should be able that these steps these components should interoperate with each other through APIs and through standards, right? Uh, and that means the workflow and its steps should read, write, and exchange it in the way that meets domain relevant community standards. And what I'm thinking, what we're thinking about here is unit testing and validating of workflow blocks, which is basically rather than monolithic scripts, thinking about how do I produce modular components, scripts or workflows that uh, do a particular task, and then I can reuse them and I can test them to make sure they really work and they're validated. And then you can publish them and other people will be able to use them, right? So we need metadata on the IO. So this is so that it can be understood and modified and built on and incorporated. And uh, there's a a movement towards this, and this is an example of a movement. This is um, the BioBB. So these are the building blocks for um, a, a community that works in computational molecular modeling. And what they've done, and these are all in the Workflow Hub, all available so you can go see them, is that they've built a collection of Python compatible wrappers for their tools, which you can then use in all different workflow systems, Galaxy or CWL or Jupyter Notebooks or a particular exotic called PyComps, which works over HPC, right? And they all have equivalent functions, right? Uh, and that means that they've worked out things like license combinations and access permissions, and they've got clean interface. And each of these is properly tested and properly managed. And then you can make lots of workflows out of them. So it's like building, it's like Lego, right? Like here, the building blocks. So you're building Lego and, and they're making sure that all works. So when you put them together, all the interfaces all work together. And another step to, towards that is this thing called the common workflow language, which is a way of describing workflows independently of their workflow management system. And that means that um, you can you can kind of therefore exchange workflows between different environments if they are common workflow language, you know, compliant. So you can move your know, workflows developed in Toil, for example, can be executed by workflows in past uh, somebody who is using the OR system, and this is what's done in the microbiome. And um, and they can still and they can run them because they're described using the common workflow language, but they're executed using a workflow environment. Um, so this is a very interesting um, uh, way. And it, in Workflow Hub, we use this as not as an execution environment, but as a way of being able to standardize descriptions so we can compare workflows in the system in the registry that are from different languages because each workflow has a different language that is described using you know to describe its its steps and and it's also very good at describing what the interface uh, what the steps are so it forces you to do the metadata there's also the issue of how do i put work 
tools, make them ready to put into my workflows. And there's a whole set of rules about that, which I'm not going to go into the details of. But there's a luckily there's a paper called 10 Simple Rules for Making a Software Tool Workflow Ready. So which is uh, supported by a bunch of people from different, including us, uh, from a different uh, different systems about how do you make your your tool, your piece of software so it could be put into another workflow system. Right. So that's uh, um, important. Piece. Um, and this comes from um, some our Japanese colleagues who say, yeah, basically what it comes down to is um, if I want to make a workflow reusable and usable, then I need to have some basic stuff like testing materials, open source license, know what the version the workflow language is, um, and be able to um find that workflow and who has done it. So it's, this is another way of thinking about it. Availability, validity and traceability. OK, so that means I'm asking you guys to make sure that when you're producing workflows or your scripts, um, does the workflow run with no errors? Does it produce expected results? Does it validate its parameters? Have you got test cases? Um, have you got checker workflows that make sure that it it does what it does, right? So, so you can kind of run it on on test data and see that it still works and that something hasn't changed. Um, and there are dedicated frameworks for simplifying all this testing uh, for different systems, but also Life Monitor here, which is an emerging um, uh, testing framework for being able to to test across different workflow systems. And so look out for that, right? That's that's coming up at the moment. And this is going to be connected to um, Workflow Hub. So if you put your workflow in, you can check, check, does it still work by using Life Monitor? And that's just, a, a, I'll, I'll skip over this bit. Uh, okay. And okay, and the last point I wanted to make, um, when you're building your workflows, do the um, a couple of things to check when you're making them. The what the data products you're producing, do they have identifiers? Are they licensed? Um, is there any restrictions on the reference data you're using that means that um, nobody could use that workflow <laughs> because they don't have access to that uh, reference data? Are you validating the parameters? Do you know where the provenance, where did the, the derived data that you produced, where did it come from? Can you report that? Are you keeping a log? And, and basically the bottom line here is that the data products that you are producing when you are writing a pipeline will exist outside of the pipeline, right? They have to exist somewhere else afterwards. So are you enabling them to do that, right? So are they fair data? So the so summary is how you can make your workflows fair. Uh, register them, right? If, they, if nothing else comes out of this, right? If you don't remember anything else, um, register your workflows and use a citation uh, file as well in your GitHub. Um, and then, you know, the rest of it is use standard identifiers, think about portability, so somebody else document your workflow for a stranger right so don't document it for you well you can document it for you because you will be a stranger to your own workflow in six months time um, but document it for strangers and use a workflow management system that is fair enabling so you know if you're think about using one of these platforms rather than you know writing your own you know on the metal python um, in order to be able to to do your your workflows and um, and think about it as software, you know, so have a management plan associated with it with a checklist. OK, and this is an interesting paper we just came across, which uh, is the first paper we've ever seen with F star 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 in the title. I think that it's going to be hard to, to Google for this paper. Uh, but anyway, um, which basically says. This is a really interesting paper, guys, actually, because um, this is an example of, 
of a paper, what these guys have done is they found some workflows and then they tried to, to access them and reuse them. And this is all the pain that they came across when they came to do it. So it's really interesting to read it and say, hmm, if they found one of mine, would they have the same pain? Um, and uh, probably would. OK, so that's the end of our talk. OK, hello, everyone. Um, thanks for joining. Yeah, so I will give this talk, but actually my colleague Bura prepared most of the material. So, and, but he cannot be here today. So a big thank to him. And I also want to say Bura is, so he's employed at EMBL and actually um, he's working sort of full time just on that stuff. So just to sort of give you a, a, a feeling that we are taking this very seriously here and want to basically do more and more work like how, um, what I kind of will give you a flavor today. Okay, so actually we got into this whole business, not out of a conceptual reason or something like that, but it was a pure practical thing, a bit like Edwin, we just didn't know what else to do. <laughs> so, and um, so actually, and there were many, many people involved in this project. So I will not go through all of them. Basically, many of them are actually on the biological side. Um, some of them on the electron microscopy side, other image analysis side. So all the people that are highlighted here with the yellow pen are the ones that actually contributed code, Python or Java code to make all of that work. Um, and then the main guy behind the scenes, many of you might know him, is of course Josh Moore in the lower left corner, who does a really, I think, incredible job of, of keeping the global community together on that project and really hopefully, you know, after 20 years of suffering, we will all have one image analysis, one image data file format and not 500 plus. Okay. Let's see where that goes. I'm quite hopeful. And then I think I would like to also thank the Jan Zuckerberg Initiative. And actually not only for funding me, but I think they're really helping in the sense that they are giving money to, for example, projects like write, write software to open OMEZAR in Napari, right? So where else do you get funding for this? So I think they actually really found a, a place where they can help is my feeling. So thank you, thanks to them. <laughs> Okay. Um, okay. So, what was our challenge? Our challenge was we had this really big 3D EM data set, so eight terabyte uncompressed 3D. Initially, we started in uh, over 10,000 TIFF planes, and then you can actually look at the data. Most of you know, if you do file import image sequence virtual stack in Fiji, you can actually deal with such data, right? So, it's not impossible. The problem is if you don't want to look at it like this, but like this, you cannot, okay? Because TIFF file format is plane wise. You can only load one plane at the time. You cannot load efficiently this without loading the whole ter a terabyte. And actually the specimen unfortunately was imaged in a way that that would have been the good way to look at it and not that, okay? So that was a big problem. So what to do? So what you actually want, and that's not the secret. This is, I think, been around for decades. You want chunk pyramidal image data storage. So, and this is what Google Maps is using, what Imaris is using, and that's really old, old stuff, right? So the um, the idea is, um, so the fine grid here are the actual pixels, and the sort of more solid uh, grid is how what's stored together together on the hard disk. So that means I can actually read these pixels here very efficiently from the hard disk because they're all together. And why is this nice? The cool thing now is if I rotate my data set and want to just look at, at some section like that, I can actually load just that section without loading all the other stuff. So in TIFF, that's not possible because in TIFF, this is all stored together on the hard disk and not in these individual chunks, okay? So that's the point of chunking. Um, and TIFF is a chunked file format, but it's a plane wise chunked format. What you want for such data is a 3D chunking with little cubes that you can load. Um, the other thing that you need is multi resolution. So, for example, if you zoom in, you actually store the data a second time 
at higher resolution and you only load the higher resolution when you can actually see it. And now again, the chunking becomes very important because now if I'm zoomed in, I only can see on my screen like the center part of this image. And then I also need the file format to support that I actually only load that center part. And again, this is why chunking is important. Okay, so, and again, this is not, I mean, this is basically agreed upon that this is the way to store big image data. So in practice, what we tried is the big data viewer file format in Fiji, um, which is doing exactly that. So we loaded the file as a virtual stack image sequence, and then we, the, you can actually save it, but then actually it didn't work. So I think our installation just couldn't cope with the eight terabyte. We had some memory leak and it was crashing. In fact, then we struggled a while and then we said, okay, let's just try Imaris. And that actually worked. And they, they have a really, really good uh, library for reading and writing image data, I have to say. Um, the other thing they do very well, I think, is that they made a good move of making the file format open. So the specification is just in the internet. And the fact that this is open and also the way they do it is basically almost identical to what Big Data Viewer is doing. I don't know who copied whom, but um, that means you can actually open that thing in Fiji. There is maybe some of you know, maybe know, there is for also for more than 10 years, there is plugins with data viewer open in Maris, okay? So that is actually, I think one of the few examples where a commercial file format <laughs> is actually helpful, yeah? <laughs> because it's open and there's good integration. Um, okay, so that was great. But then we wanted to share this data with collaborators that are not at the MDL. So in fact, um, there is even a sort of add-on to this whole Fiji ecosystem that you can download and install and it's called the big data server. Um, and what that does, you put that, so this is not in Fiji, you have to install that somewhere else, but you kind of put that on top of your um, data set, which is actually, by the way, I didn't say it's technically stored in something that's called HDF5. And then that thing would expose a web server where via HTTP, you can actually say, um, oh, sorry, wrong direction. Uh, give me that chunk, okay? So it translates the, the, the HDF5 storage chunk into an HTTP request. And then somebody in the else else in the world can open Fiji and then connect to this big data server. So this all exists also for many, many years. I actually didn't know, but then I learned it. And then it could in principle lazy load individual chunks like that. Okay, we thought awesome, yeah, that's it. But the problem is our um, security person at IT said, no, you don't do that. <laughs> so basically we will not open an HTTP access to our file server. So it's just not gonna happen, okay? Just too insecure. Um, that was a very sad. Mm. So what's the problem? So I think the problem is if you sort of give some access to a normal file system, then if some sort of hacker gets there, they have a lot of things they can do, okay? So a normal file system basically supports tons of things um, that you can do. And I think that's hard to manage. And my understanding is this is part of the problem why this is such a security risk, okay? And actually, I think this is also part of the reason I'm not the super expert and there might be other reasons why in the cloud, people typically don't actually use file systems if they want to share stuff with, with other people on the globe, but they use this thing called object store. And, and the point is, and as far as I understand it, is why is this now much safer? It's because it's much, much simpler. You can actually almost forget about the lower two. There's basically just two things you can say. You can either say, put an object there or give me an object and that's it. There's none of all this other stuff, which is then much easier to manage, okay? And this is why actually Amazon, I think they are very big on that. And also Google, they have all their object stores. And um, I think that's how they do a lot of the things. So actually also our IT department, I think they realized that this is a thing. And then uh, Josef, um, actually spent a lot of time setting up an S3 infrastructure at the MDL. And I think they're really rolling this out now sort of 
seriously that each user at Ambu gets access to that. Okay. Um, so, how does that now work with um, with this big image data? So we need now actually a file format that works well with this simple idea get one object. Okay, and this is basically where Josh came in, and in fact also in parallel um, Stefan Saalfeld from Janilia. I don't know some of you have might have heard about N5. I will not go there now, but it's basically the exact same idea. It was a sort of parallel development, but. Um, I think also, luckily, now Stefan Salfer from Janilia, they're also behind what Josh is doing. So we will have no fighting there um, between two new standards, which would be a sort of annoying. <laughs> so I think that's actually working OK. So, um, so the idea is actually super simple. So you just say one chunk is one object. OK, so basically, the way you store your image is every Chunk here is one thing that you store on. In, in the end, I think also an object store is nothing else than a hard disk at some point. So there is just one file also, or object per chunk. Um, and then you can actually very easily say, if I want to get that chunk, just give me that file. OK, so this is the very simple idea that both Saalfeld had and um, actually the Czar community. Um, okay. Long story short, we did all of that. In fact, actually, it was, of course, a lot of work. And initially, we didn't actually do OME ZAR because I think it wasn't really there yet. So we started with the N5 implementation from, uh, from Janilia. But now we are switching over, and that actually really works. So, and this is something we will try in the uh, practical session together. So you can see yourself that you can actually browse an eight terabyte image um, on some random computer with that technology. Aha. So I'm always getting confused myself. So that's why I'm, okay. I think the easiest right now is maybe if we all go to this, GitHub thing that actually Bura lovingly prepared. Mm. Okay, so and we have to go now to the band again. So I will, and we do this together, okay? So. And that's actually sort of part of the course also. So if you want to do stuff in the cloud, there's not only Jupyter notebooks, you can actually have full-fledged desktop computers, which is, I think, for our field also not so bad because then you can run Fiji. <laughs> it's just, I think, a bit difficult in the Jupyter notebook. <laughs> um, okay. So I think here we said four CPUs, but actually many of you might have now already a running desktop. I'm not sure if that's, uh, so if you have a running desktop, then you just click go to desktop. If not, then you do four CPU, eight gig memory, and then you say launch, okay? So I already, mine is still running for some reason. And I will then just go there. Okay. So now comes for me the challenging part. We have to open the GitHub repo website also in this computer. And I don't know how to copy and paste into it. So, but I think you might have probably already. So the up here is the, um, the Firefox icon. And we have to now get there. And I think, so we thought a lot about how to make that not too difficult and the easiest we could come up with, but maybe there are more clever ways is, so we made this tiny URL, I will post it again. So that's something you can actually type by hand <laughs> in the, uh, up, up here basically. Yeah? So HTTP 
but maybe you did all of that already because you must have somehow copy and pasted the uh, first of all everything we do right now you can also do in theory at home you just have to install all the software that we installed and actually i will not go there now this will take too long but if you click afterwards on that link there is how we installed all of that and basically if you i think if you know how to use conda a little bit then everything should be sort of possible for you but get get back to us so it's all based on some conda installations of something so nothing difficult so the first thing we will do is we will introspect an OMIZAR data set and actually we will for that copy something that's actually stored in the cloud so this is a sort of cloud address which is hosted at EMBL and we will copy it locally okay so and for what for that I will just copy this whole command and paste it here and press enter okay so this is basically now you learned how to download data from an object store onto a computer okay so copy so it basically there is this thing called mc and that's a, a command line uh, thing and mirror means copy okay so that's not too difficult so then we can look what did we actually download so for the non linux people ls is sort of look into this folder and as it was already mentioned an OMVR is actually a folder so paste and um, Okay, and we actually see there is a bunch of files, okay, and um, a bunch of other folders. Okay, so now let's look a little bit of what that actually means. So important files are these dot set attribute files, they contain all the metadata. Um, so let's print the content of one of these files. So for this, we just copy and paste this thing. This is basically just a Linux way of saying, please print the content of this file and it's just a simple text file okay so that's also important that everything should be simple right and not something complicated so this is just a text file and in the text file for those of you that might know we have this sort of stuff and that's called a json way of specifying metadata and that's also an absolute super duper standard okay so we have a text file and we have json i think you cannot be more standard than that at, on this planet right now okay so that's uh, just to to you know give you a bit of the idea um, um okay co what can we see actually our file seems to have several axes and they have units and they have types and actually this should look very familiar for you it's a typical x y z channel time data set okay so we support actually currently exactly those dimensions or a subset of them and you can have units and you know this is a space coordinate and it's a micrometer yeah so i think this is actually fair enough i think that's understandable then comes maybe a little bit more hairy so um and i also have to think now shortly so now comes the coordinate transformations so there were long 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 discussions how do we want to encode pixel size in this file format okay i mean that's obviously very important you want to know how big one pixel is and actually the Consensus is now we don't want to do it in that simple way. We want to say there is a certain voxel space. Okay, this is how we store the data. And there should be a mapping from voxel space to physical space. Okay, in a very generic way. It could be something very complicated. And, and the way to map from voxel space to physical space is via a coordinate transformation from voxel space to physical space, like in some of you might have in math. Okay, and right now we only support one or actually not, but mainly one very simple coordinate <laughs> transformation, which we call scaling, okay? And, and this is basically just the voxel sizes, okay? And you have to, and it's the same 
axis or the SD axis on top. So this would mean 0.14 seconds. Then channel was also big discussion. How do <laughs> is that even a normal dimension or not? So right now it is. And what's the unit of a channel? Actually, you see here there's no unit. So you see all these things are actually harder than it looks. Okay, but then the Z. Oh, somehow the Z dimension in my case is lacking the unit. For you too, probably. Okay, so, so I have to. I think it doesn't. Okay, so there should be micrometer. I don't know what happened. Um, okay, and then X and Y, they both have the same. Uh, so 88 <laughs> nanometer. All right. Sounds good. So this is how we store metadata at the moment. And we want to bet, get more fancy here soon, like that you can do like uh, transform stuff, more correct, rotate stuff, value loaded, and so on. OK, then actually, the, you see there is another coordinate transformation and another one. And actually, everything stays the same. But on the, 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 the space, co the x, the x, uh, the, so this is x, y, x, y, there it becomes bigger the voxel size. And the reason is that these paths, they specify the resolution pyramid. OK, so we store the data, in fact, three times. This is at the highest resolution level, and then downsampled once and downsampled another time. And that means from this downsampled voxel space to physical space, we need a different scaling. OK, so that's, that's basically the, all the information that's on this highest level metadata. Any question? Just I can't actually see you, so you just have to speak. Uh, Christian, maybe yes. very obvious. So what you specify is actually just the level of resolution, but there is a single version of the data. You are not storing the lower resolution data, right? Yes. So it's so actually you are just saying what is the number to get the the lower resolution version. Yeah, but it's stored. So in fact, if we um if I go back here, so there are three subfolders. And this zero and this one and this two are exactly those zero and one, two. And this actually actually doesn't have to be zero, one, two. There could be hello world tomorrow. Okay. So and and in these subfolders, there is physically stored the the different resolution. And data, is there times. any reason why you need to store because uh, you know resampling the images may take a long time? Or that, that's the Google try? Maps thing. So if if on okay. Google Maps, if you're on, on a zoomed out version of the world, you don't want to load all the voxel data that tells you where the flower pot in Heidelberg is. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So thank actually, you. the point is. Yeah. Kota. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um. So. Um, about these different resolutions and this, uh, um, so there's now there's three different resolutions, right? Yes. Um, is it always three or this is somehow designed that it's kind of flexibly? Whatever you want. Actually, this will come so later. Is... Yeah. Okay. Thanks. So I actually think we are at that line. So now let's look into one of these other files into one of these subfolders. Copy, paste. So now we are actually in the highest resolution uh, part. And there is a file called set array. And let's look what's inside. Actually, this is interesting. OK, this is the data type. I, the first time I consciously look at that, I would have hoped there's something more readable, but I think that means eight bits unsigned integer or something. Um, so I have to get checked back on that why this looks so funny, but um, that would be nice if it's a bit more human readable, but maybe there's a good reason because you want to know your data type, but, but maybe this is one byte unsigned or something. Yeah, and I don't know what this thing is. Maybe this means. Well, I don't know. OK, but that's the data type. So sorry, I'm actually not sure now. Then the shape 
is important. So this is basically how big is this image in terms of pixels, okay? So I have 11 time points, two channels, five set planes, and this is X and Y, okay? So that's basically where you could check how big your image is, if you want to go that way. I mean, there will be libraries, of course, that do that for you, but it, I just want to show that this is actually not, you know, it's human readable. And this is the chunking. So what that would, would mean, each uh, channel and set slice and time point are one individual file. This is actually how some people store TIFFs also, right? So basically you just store one TIFF per actual plane. So this is how that would basically be the same. We have now one file for each XY plane and we don't chunk in XY. So there we have everything in one file. Okay, so that's basically where you can get such information. So how it's laid out on disk. Um, if you want to look at that all in one go, there is actually a way. So there is this cool thing called tree. So if we copy that and paste that, then you can in one go see um, how this whole thing looks on disk. So, so we do see this is one of the disadvantages. There are a lot of thing files, but essentially there's a whole, whole folder structure. So each of those zeros in the end would be one plane like you are. And this is just a simple binary without any metadata. So this just really contains the raw pixel data, okay? So if you have an apl application that really only wants to load that plane, then this application can basically only load this chunk from the disk without loading any of the other stuff. Okay, that's the, that's the idea. But you wouldn't do that manually. There are libraries for you that will do that, and I will get to that in a sec. Now, let's say your data is actually in an object store, not on your hard disk, but you still want to know sort of what's in there. Right? There is this tool that the uh, OME consortium maintains or OME czar. So I copy this and you see this is actually a web address. Okay, now that comes the cloud thing because right now there was not much cloud. This is all uh, a computer. Um, apart from that, this is a cloud computer, but as I said, it doesn't matter. So now we are really looking into a cloud stored version of that whole thing and um, getting some information. And everybody in the world could do that now that has this link. So everybody in the world could do that on their computer, no matter whether they live in wherever country. Okay. And, um, and here actually it's a sort of other summary of the data. So it tells you um, how big is your data on the three different resolution levels. Um, I didn't try that. Actually, I just pasted it in. Let's do that for one other file, which is actually this eight terabyte file that I was talking about before. So I don't know if this will be now much slower. <laughs> I don't know actually what that exactly does. Let's see. Okay, fair enough. So this is in fact, if you have a good memory, you might remember that I said we had 11,000 uh, TIFF slices that was the original data format so so this is this eight a terabyte um, 3d volume that's stored at that web address and you see here we have actually a lot of um, resolution layers that are not needed to for smooth browsing let's look at it for example in napari so i just copy and paste this line and this is now opening the locally stored data set that we copied in the beginning of the practical on our computer. And launching Napari is taking a bit. So that's usually not a sign that anything crashed. And you who? Some of you might know this data set, very classic image day sample data. And we can do the usual stuff. We can go through the set dimensions and the time and so on. OK. 
Okay, so this is basically just, so I will not teach you anything about Napari, okay, no time. But the uh, point is you can open such data with Napari, okay? <laughs> and, and people are supporting this. Um, I will immediately close it again, because now comes the sort of cooler part. The next line, actually, this is a web address, okay? So copy, paste. And same thing, okay? You can open this. And in fact, you have to trust me, the way it does it, it does not download everything initially, but it will only download on demand what it currently needs for the display, okay? So it's, it's using this chunked uh, storage for loading only what's needed, okay? Good, now let's try that with the eight terabyte data set. Let's be ambitious. This for sure, it, this will be a proof that it will not download it, right? If that works. <laughs> oh, oh, does something? Let's go to a different set plane. And it does load it, but it's not, it takes time, right? So it's not super duper smooth. And I think if now, if we zoom in, I think zooming in is, I assuming out works. Zooming in, mouse wheel, it actually. Oh, not so bad. So this is with the mouse wheel. Yeah. Okay, I think I think the message here is it sort of works. Okay, so I think if, if Napa, Napari and they admit it, they are not very good at reading very big files. Okay, it's, it's sort of working, but it's not like you see it's now hanging a little bit. Okay, so that's basically I think if a take home message that is fair, that um, that's not you know not super convenient. Okay, but in principle possible, maybe they will work on it. Let's close Napari. Um, let's do the same in Fiji. Um, okay, so to open Fiji, we just type Fiji. Okay, and then in Fiji, we have to do what's written here. And I think to save time, maybe you can just trust me that the small data set works. Maybe let's immediately go for the for the fat guy, okay? Um, so plugins, big data viewer, OMEZAR, open OMEZAR from S3. So S3 is the object store. And now comes the challenge you have to somehow copy and paste from here into here. I hope you manage somehow. <laughs> This is actually code that I co-maintain, so we just put that there because we think it's a nice uh, default. But um, okay, that's actually good if it's the default, then you don't have to copy and paste. I forgot. Then you can just press OK. All right. So now in big data viewer, changing the set slice is the mouse wheel. Zooming in is with the arrow up key on your keyboard. And actually, so I, I wrote that code. I thought it was interesting. You can, you can actually, here it really tells you what does it load from the cloud, okay? So you can see exactly um, which chunks are loaded from, from, the, from the object store and, and also which, with which speed. And you see, we save the data, it's unsigned integer 8-bit in a way that each chunk is roughly one megabyte. I think somebody had the question. So we, we thought we 
benchmarked it a little bit, but what feels good. And here you see, um, this is from the third resolution layer. Um, and that's the number of the, of the of the chunk in the file. So this is, means we can go even higher, I think, because we had like six resolution layers or something. I know, zero is the highest. So, yeah, okay. So now it's loading from the highest um, resolution. Christian, okay, and that's, sorry. Yeah. Is there a way to map spatially uh, the um, identifier of the chunk to you know, some position in the sample? Um, yes, so if if you, I mean, that's exactly what the coordinate transformation is doing. Okay. Uh, actually, not really. So the chunking, no, it's the voxel. So the chunk is, is bigger than a voxel. Um, so for the chunk itself, I think it's not so easy. I mean, you could write down the formula, but it's not, I mean, this is what the library is actually doing for you. So this whole chunking stuff is not something what we actually specify anywhere really on the metadata because this is what the ZAR library in fact is doing sort of, yeah, so. Okay, because yeah. I see I see that this could be helpful for user, you know, just to understand if I observe this, where it is in my sample, is it at the, bottom part of the sample or the top at least to give some some indication yeah. about this that's true but i think this is on the left is also nothing i'd ever used for anything to, but for giving a course i think it's just cool to see that it actually loads a chunk but it's nothing i don't know i think i never had the use case where i would have to share that information with someone okay so i don't know yeah but yeah but i think in theory you could do it actually another could feel Cool thing now with Big Data Viewer, I think that's something you cannot do in feature, in Napari is if you hold your left mouse button, if you click in the middle, you hold it fix, and then you drag somewhere, you are rotating um, the viewing axis. So this is what I said initially, this was really what we needed for this whole project. We needed to look at the thing um, along this, because this is the head and that's the tail and these are the arms, okay? And this is basically a non-orthogonal slicing of the whole data set. And in, you can also rotate and stuff like that, okay? I mean, this was basically the, why we got into all of that stuff because we needed to look at that thing from, you know, different uh, axes and so on. Good, yeah, did it work? You? All of you, you could open it. Okay, so I mean, that was basically our main use case why we got interested because we wanted to share such data with, with the world, basically. <laughs> and then we had no, no way, but I think now these days this is possible, which is sort of cool. Okay, then I'm closing Fiji. And let's go to yet another way of looking at OMSR. Um, and that is in the browser. So we are looking now at the exact same file again, now the small one, because I think this also has trouble with the big one. Um, again, same HTTP address, uh, but that's only again, so Chrome wins clearly today. So that works better in Chrome. So to open Chrome, you have to go to applications, internet, Google Chrome. So applications, internet, Google Chrome. And then copy and paste this web address here. And actually I also like that it's very easy to understand. So the first part of the web address is the viewer and the second part is where is my data. Okay, so good for fair science, I think. Um, paste and go to and UP. I can look at the same data set in the web browser. And I'm actually not, okay, here are the set sliders. Here's the time slider and you have brightness and contrast settings. Yeah, so this is really, I think the whole vision of that. And I actually really honestly excited 
uh, about that because you, I save the data in one place and I can open it in Apari, in Fiji, and in the browser. And I think that's really pretty cool. Um, and it's no complicated nothing. It's just standard software and very everything very standard simple. Yeah, no complicated anything. I mean, I don't know, but for my taste, this is quite quite nice. Let's quickly create an OMSR in the end, okay? Because I think this was the question. So um, uh, first of all, we need a normal image. So we have to copy one from an object store. So you can also store normal images in an object store, by the way, right? So it doesn't have to be an OMSR. In fact, you can store everything as long as it's an object, which means it's a bunch of bytes, as far as I know. So now we copy it something from the object store folder image data into our local folder image data. Let's look, what did we actually copy? We copied a TIFF file, you -hoo. Okay, and it's actually the same thing that we had before, but as a TIFF file and now converting that to OMSR. There are Python libraries, there are Java libraries. I, I think the current sort of standard way that I would recommend of doing it is installing this thing on your computer. And you can do this with Conda and you can figure out the installation on the link that I had above. And then this is also what officially supported by, by OME. And then you have a bunch of options. How do you want to compress your data? There are several compression algorithms. I think all of them lossless as far as I know, how many resolution levels you want. This is some sort of technicality that I don't even understand myself. It's just something we had to do to make this practical work smoothly. So I don't know. Um, but there you could also specify the chunking and, uh, and all of that. So it's basically uh, one command line call. And then it has very simple one in input and output. Okay. So that's what I would use today to convert a TIFF file to OMSR. The good thing is this is bioformats. So what so here you can put anything that bioformats understands. Okay, so this is very important, of course. Um, like for example, your whatever your microscope outputs. Okay, and then we paste this. It's converting it. Okay, it doesn't actually say something like super, I'm happy I'm finished, just which is a bit weird. Um, so let's check if it actually did it. And I don't have the command here now. Okay, so what we have to do is we have to copy and paste. We have to type ls for list and then copy, paste the folder into which we created the thing and thing and I have something, but I'm not sure now if that's just me because I did it before. So that's basically how you create one of these guys. And I think the rest I, I can, for sake of time, well, actually I can just say it is also not, it's sort of, and that is how you would then copy it to the object store, okay? so. And then you have your data. So you basically, if you would like to share data with anybody in the world, it's copy and paste these two lines into a terminal window and press enter. Okay. Um, if you have installed these two tools and if you have an object store, which is probably the biggest problem. <laughs> but otherwise it's actually not so difficult. Okay. It's really only create it locally and then copy it. And this works right now for you because, and this was why the installation procedure was a little bit weird, because here are actually two credentials. This, um, okay, this is the actual web address. And this is under the hood, the web address with the credentials. So uh, hello everybody, and <laughs> thanks for staying until uh, the very end. My name is Ignacio Ganda Carreras. Um, in this very last class, I'm gonna tell you a little bit 
about how to use machine and deep learning methods for uh, segmentation, which is a crucial task in bioimage analysis. So this is what I will follow more or less. So we have this very first 45 minutes of lecture as in the previous uh, session, where I will go through the basics of uh, segmentation and I will jump now that you are almost experts on deep learning uh, about the most uh, popular approaches to do segmentation uh, using deep learning, either what we call uh, top-down methods or bottom-up uh, methods. We'll go through the details of the probably the most important architecture to do this, uh, the unit in 2D and 3D, and then we'll see some tricks to the post-processing and obtain what we really want. Then we'll see the state-of-the-art um, architecture that, uh, and, and methods that have been proposed lately as a Stardust and Cellpost in a little bit of detail, and then we'll see, uh, we will propose a more uh, generic uh, pipeline uh, based on, on, on a multitask network and samples processing that I, I will explain, because then we're going to be able to do this in, in the tutorial uh, for, well, my data set, but you could also do it for uh, your own data set. Again, the last uh, 15 minutes will be for questions and answers. And uh, finally, we will have uh, 30 minutes in Google Collab to play with uh, the last thing that I mentioned. Okay, so let's jump into it. Uh, what is image segmentation? Uh, probably you, many know, otherwise uh, let me introduce it to you. This is the process of partitioning an image into multiple segments. So that's why we call it segmentation, image segmentation. It is typically related to finding either the, what we call the objects of interest in our images, or at least their boundaries, right? So based on this definition, uh, if we have an image like this, then this would be a proper segmentation. Or we have separated what we could consider the object of interest in this image that are, for me, the nuclei and the cell bodies, right? But uh, more precisely, we also call uh, image segmentation the process of assigning to every pixel in the image one label such that pixels with the same label, they belong to the same category, maybe related to what we have heard before, or that serve some, some characteristics in the image. For example, in this case, we have uh, pixels in blue, the, the blue label, that uh, means that all those pixels belong to the category nuclei. No? The green label is for uh, cytoplasm or uh, cell bodies, and the black label could be for membranes and, and background. So because we are assigning categories and we are assigning a meaning to every pixel, this is what we usually find in the literature called as semantic segmentation. Okay. But there's also uh, another type of segmentation that also fits with this definition. That is this one. Okay. We could also apply one label to every instance of every category that we find in the in the image, meaning that every instance of a nuclei, I'm going to assign it a different uh, number, a different identifier, a different color. And every uh, cytoplasm, uh, the same thing, right? So here, every different object has a different identifier. Here, we represent it with colors. But in, at the end of the day, this is what we call a label image. So every uh, pixel with the same color it just has the same number. But we, we have usually assign a color map to visualize it better. And because we are here assigning labels to instances, this is called instance segmentation, okay, as opposed to semantic segmentation. So how do we uh, measure, how do we evaluate how well um, a segmentation method uh, works? Well, and we have some very common metrics, for example, what we call the intersection over the union that can be used either for detection or for a segmentation. In, in detection, instead of having the mask of our object, we have only what we call a bounding box, no? these uh, four points that define a box uh, around our objects, but it's, it could be the same thing. So what we do is we take the, our predicted bounding box and we want to measure how well it matches the ground truth a bounding box or the ground tooth mask of our segmentation. So what we do is that we take the intersection area and divide by the area of the union of both uh, regions or mask. So basically we have 
um, a value between zero and one. That's why it's called also uh, the Jacquard index. It's an index where zero means no overlap at all. So our result is a disaster. We haven't uh, detected anything or we haven't segmented anything that uh, we want. Or one where uh, they perfectly match. No? The segmentation or the detection is, is perfect. In general, people say, okay, when do I know that um, my results are good? Well, results, let's say of uh, 0.80 something, 0 0.9, they are already very good. They usually with that, you can work and do a proper analysis. But this is for one object and one class, but what, what happens if we have different objects and different uh, classes? How do we know that this prediction was aiming at this object here and not at this other one over here. So for that, what we usually do is saying, OK, I consider that this box is matching this ground truth box if they overlap a minimum uh, value. And that value is defined by what I just defined, the, the intersection over the union. So when you read results uh, based on, on the usually detection or multiple classes, you would, you would see something like, OK, it has this precision with a, a IOU, an intersection of a union of 0, 0.5, meaning to consider it a positive case, they have to overlap at least 0, 0.5 of uh, IOU, or 0, 0.75, that, in, that includes uh, much more overlap. And while we do this, then we, start, we can count to positive, false positive, we can extract the typical metrics, and then uh, a very common one that you can find is the average precision. If we have different classes, we take the mean of all those classes, or so the mean average precision. But with the intersection over the union, we can work quite, quite nicely. So what kind of approaches do we have in, in deep learning to do this? Well, if we go to the, to the field or uh, to the domain of natural images, and by natural images, I mean Images that uh, contain anything, like this one, for example, no? uh, our daily uh, things, dogs and houses, uh, trees, uh, etc. It is very common to have what we call uh, what we call a top-down approach. We have a monstrous network that what it does is uh, breaking the, the big problem of multiple object segmentation into a smaller ones. So inside the network, there are also other networks. For example, let me go very fast through this one that is uh, called the mask RCNN or the mask region uh, convolutional neural network. And then you will see what I say that it's, it's a monster. So basically, it takes the input image, it passes it through uh, CNN, convolutional neural network. It's called the backbone network. And this one are usual networks that uh, that are popular at that time, okay? So maybe a ResNet 50 or anything that you, you can imagine that has been trained, usually pre-trained on classifying images like this. So it has a lot of information about natural images. And then out of the, the output of that network at different layers, then we get some feature maps that go through another network that has one target, that is pro producing proposals of parts of the image where uh, it's more likely to find objects. So it, it provides, on the one hand, bounding boxes of possible objects. And uh, on the other hand, it provides also a score saying, OK, is 90% uh, likely to have here an object, or is 0, 05 or 0, 04. OK? And then all those uh, proposals are sorted. And the most likely ones go through another uh, network that does classification. And then every box is classified to say, OK, it contains an object of this type. Okay? And then it also refines, at the same time, the, the bounding box. And in the last uh, version of, of, of this uh, architecture, they included this mask. So they have yet another small network on top to do the uh, small mask, small segmentation of every object. So they do. At the same time, uh, region proposals, okay? They provide the bounding box locations. They classify what is inside that box. In this case, there's a dog, a dog, a cat, okay? 
with respect to the background. So the background is uh, set apart by the, the region proposal. And then it does the mask prediction as well. So this is usually a very large and heavy network. Yeah. So can we use this in bioimage analysis? Well, uh, we can. Why not? I mean, uh, we can take uh, an image like this and then try to process everything that is in the field of view of, of, the, of the network. Okay? So in the end, uh, in, the, in this um, type of image, this electron microscopy image is where the target is to segment every single uh, mitochondria. This is what we will do in the tutorial. Well, the mass carcinin uh, is able, we train it enough, and it's not uh, also that uh, easy. To, it provides the bonding boxes of every single object and the individual mass. OK, what is the problem here? Well, that the um, processing images uh, need to be of usually a larger field of view as we have in uh, bioimage analysis. Now, this is an example. This is actually a representation of this image. This is a small uh, old data set from 2011. And this is a, a data set that uh, we released a, a couple of years ago, where we have all the uh, mitochondria segmented. Okay, we want to segment this. How do we do with a, a mask or CNN? Well, I mean, there's, there's, there's a big problem of that it doesn't fit into the so-called backbone network, right? So one um, intuitive idea would be to, okay, divide and conquer. We take the large data set, we divide it into patches, and then patches, of, of course, that fit into the, that uh, backbone net. And then we can calculate if we have trained our model for that and obtain all these uh, nice results. We still have some problems, and that is that okay, we may have instances that go through different patches. You see that here, some of them are cat, right? So, uh, moreover, not only uh, in a couple of adjacent uh, patches uh, in this data set that we release, there's plenty of small uh, mitochondria, but there's also uh, a considerable number of very large mitochondria that go through the entire data set, and that we need to follow. Okay. So in that case, there's the, the problem of assigning uh, instances that we have correctly uh, identified in between uh, patches. Okay? And if this is uh, not trivial at all. So because this and another problems in bioimage analysis, we usually uh, try to do uh, something different. That is the, the opposite approach. We do the bottom-up approach, where we focus on solving first the smaller problems. Okay? And then we integrate them into a complete solution by building the so-called workflow or a pipeline. Oh, um, in, in this case, we have our full image. And we could say the first small problem that we want to solve is to find the object probabilities of our uh, object of interest, in this case, our mitochondria. And once we have hopefully this perfectly done, then out of this image, we would like to extract the individual instances. Okay. So the, the purpose of this approach is to design a whole pipeline or workflow to first identify here all the pixels or voxels. We, got, we could do this in, in 3D as well of uh, every object of interest. And then somehow, we don't know yet how, extract the instances. So. Of course, we're talking about uh, deep learning, right? So the very first step, and it's also a common approach, is usually performed now building here uh, an architecture, a deep architecture. Actually, this task is a semantic segmentation task, so we can look for semantic segmentation network. And then for uh, this last small problem, we may think on uh, different solutions. So what kind of networks can we use for this? Well, if we go to the literature, we will see that, especially after the year 2015, everything gets dominated by a type of architecture that is called the unit, okay? or unit-like architectures. You will see that they are quite popular. This is an architecture that was actually the first one uh, published um, 
as a, a convolutional network specific for biomedical image segmentation. But as you will see, it can be applied in many generic problems in computer vision. And uh, a year later, it was published, uh, well, it's 3D version, which is also uh, very similar. And it, this is the foundation of uh, many solutions. So let me go and spend a little bit of time explaining you how it works. This is a figure from the original uh, paper. This is a unit. It's called unit because it has this characteristic U shape. Okay, And then it has uh, mainly two paths. We have what we call the encoder or the contracting path, where the input is our image, and it goes through some uh, convolutional layers. Okay, So here, we calculate some uh, feature maps. And then we would like to also extract features at a different uh, scale. So we downsample the, um, the feature maps by usually either a max pooling or an average pooling or any kind of operation that allows us to reduce the dimensionality, usually by two. And then we do more convolutions to extract more features at that uh, level. Okay? Usually we double the number of filters, but we reduce by two the size of the of the feature maps. So we do this, convolutions, uh, down sampling, convolutions, down sampling, and we have a very reduced or summarized uh, representation of the feature maps in this region here that we call the bottleneck. And then we go up. We do up samplings and convolutions, up samplings and convolutions until we recover the original size of the input image. In the very original paper, the, the size wasn't exactly the same, but now it's very common to use convolutions that maintain the, the size. So the input is an image of a specific size, and the output is one or more images of exactly the same size. Another mm, characteristic of this network are these connections here that go from directly from the feature maps of the encoder to the feature maps of the decoder. Okay? This uh, provides a way of uh, sharing information between both paths. And also, it has a lot of uh, positive effects in the in the training, avoids some uh, problems, and maintains the stability of, of the network. Okay, so as I said, this is the this was published for segmentation. But as you can imagine, if the input is an image and the output is an image of the same size or several images of the same size, we can apply this for segmentation. But for any other uh, type of operation that we call uh, image translation. Now, for example, we, we may have a noise image here and a denoise image here. We may have a black, uh, grayscale image here, a, a color image here. We can do plenty of operations like this in, in, in computer vision thanks to this architecture. A year later, uh, it was presented the 3D version. Okay. It's actually, as you will see, this very same idea with the convolutions and downsamplings and then upsamplings and convolutions and skip connections, but everything is in 3D. The number of filters that are here, well, is actually a parameter that you have to play with. In 3D, you usually do less filtering because it's, it's more expensive. And also, while you do the downsampling or the upsampling, um, you, if the data is isotropic, you do it in 3D. But if you have different resolution in Z, you may not want to reduce the same uh, the same amount of uh, pixels or voxels in in that direction. Okay, so this is something that you can you can also play with. Okay, so we have now a solution. It's actually proved to be quite uh, efficient to perform the very first task. No, the object uh, probability calculation in 2D or 3D. How do we do out of this the uh, instance extraction? No? How do we pass from the object probabilities to something like this, a label image? Well, a very simple idea is to apply a threshold. OK, so we have if ideally we get a very nice uh, high probability objects here. If we apply a threshold of something like 0, 5, then we will identify nicely the objects and then we can find the connected regions somehow on, on these white objects, right? So how do we do this? There is probably, as some of you already know, there's a classic method to do uh, connected components, so connected components labeling or connected components that basically transforms a binary image into a label image, an image with every 
instance with a, a single identifier. Actually, if we have an image like this, we have to invert it because it works on white objects and black uh, background usually, and there's plenty of implementations to do this. The, the most classic one is based on flat film, no? like you, when you're doing paint, you click once and then it fills the entire uh, region with a, with a single color. No? This, is, this is quite efficient. And there's implementations in, in, in Python, in, in ImageJ, uh, et cetera. The only thing that you usually have to select is the connectivity. There's one parameter to decide if the, the pixels in the neighborhood of, uh, of every pixel can be considered um, a neighbor if they are in the diagonals or not, right? So basically in 2D, this would be four connectivity or six connectivity. What does it mean in practice? It means that if we use um, four or six in 3D, the objects uh, usually get uh, more rounded than we, if we use the diagonal connectivity. So if you are um, playing with images like this, where well, you have to uh, segment blob-like structures, cells, mitochondria, etc., you want to use uh, the smaller uh, connectivity values. Okay. But of course, as always, there are some problems. If uh, the most, the two typical problems when we do segmentations are splits and mergers. Uh, let's imagine that I have these object probabilities that are more or less fine. I mean, this, let's assume these are provided by our model, and then we binarize them. So as we see in the ground truth here, we have a single object, and then we have a split it into three different regions. Okay, so this is a typical uh, error here. Maybe we use a very low threshold. So these two objects, they get merged together and uh, they were a single object. So the problem is that the results are too sensitive to the binarization process and also the, the probability calculation that we have. So can we do better? Well, we can use something uh, a little bit more uh, complicated than a simple binarization that is using the all good classic uh, watershed method. This is still a very powerful solution. Uh, maybe some of you already know the, the watershed um, algorithm is uh, now classic, it's from the 80s, but it's still uh, a very nice solution that takes a gray scale image and then it makes a topographic analogy. It considers uh, the gray values as if they were altitudes in a, um, in a topographic surface. So high, high pixel values, they are mountains, right? And low pixel values, they are our valleys. So in the algorithm, it identifies the local minima. And then for every local minima, it rises uh, what they are called some uh, flat basin. So they, it flats. The, the valleys from the bottom uh, towards the top with different, uh, for every different minima, we have a different label. And it goes iteratively from the bottom to, a, to the top or to a specific top value that we decide. And when two water sources touch each other, we set a border, okay? So we set what we call uh, the a dam in the water set uh, paper. Actually, if we have uh, an image, for example, like this, uh, with a nicely uh, fluorescent uh, marker for the membranes, well, it would represent it in 3D. They actually look like a mountain change with valleys and, and peaks. And this is very intuitive to see how we rise water from each of those holes. When they touch each other, they're gonna do it at the brightest point of our uh, membranes, right? So this, in principle, should work very nice. Of course, if nothing is perfect because even if we have images like this that, that look nicely dark in the inside, uh, they may contain actually many local minima. It's not just zero here. It could be one, seven, eight, six, etc. And from every local uh, minimum, we're gonna rise the water with a different label. So we may end up with a classic problem of over segmentation. There are different solutions, but one could be to impose those uh, minima either manually, semi-automatically, or completely automatically. Why I'm saying this? Because we can also train our models to have an output, which is the marker. Now, one single 
uh, marker per object. And then we can uh, help the post-processing by having these outputs in our models. There is, of course, a bunch of solutions based on classic methods like applying uh, filtering or use um, some tolerance in the location of the, of the minima that may allow us to do this in an automatic way without needing of, uh, of, of a deep learning model. But uh, you have to keep this in mind because it's also a nice solution. And you may think, OK, but what happens if I don't have a very nice fluorescence marker that uh, reflects my the borders of my cells so nicely, but still I have some, some contrasted objects? Well, in classic computer vision, what we used to do is, OK, we apply a gradient filter. OK, so basically in the regions of a maximum change of contrast, we get peaks, and then we have kind of uh, the same idea of the fluorescence marker, right? We have the the borders nicely highlighted with respect to the um, uh, to, uh, to the rest of flat or homogeneous uh, regions, and then we can run water cell on top. If this is not as obvious, there's applying a, a kind of a gradient filter. Again, as we will see, we could also make our model to learn the representation like that with the idea of facilitating the post-processing. And finally, uh, there is um, an idea that I, I, I need to explain to you. First, because it's related to what we're going to do later in the tutorial or in the, in, in, in the pipeline that I'm going to propose to you, but also because this is uh, <laughs> something very popular in, in ImageJ or Fiji. If you ever use it, probably you, you, you know that there's a, a command that is called watershed, but it doesn't do what I just explained. The, the watershed command in, in, in ImageJ, what it does is out of a binary image like this, it finds separations between objects that are touching. So how does, how does it do it? How, how is this possible? So the, the, the thing is, it doesn't do only watershed, it does more things. Imagine that we have this image and we have binarized uh, using, for example, a threshold value of uh, an automatic uh, threshold in an algorithm. And we get this nice initial segmentation, but we, our objects are obviously merged uh, together. And there we cannot run water set on top of it because we don't have nice valleys and mountains. We have just two values, which is black and white. So to, what we can do is to simulate those uh, valleys. And how do we do this? We take um, an operation is called a distance transform or distance map that assigns to every pixel in the object the distance to the closest border. So basically, for every object, the, we have peaks at the center, especially if they are rounded, center of the of the objects. Again, we don't we don't want peaks at the center, but we want uh, valleys. So what we can do is just take the inverse or the negative uh, distance as we do here, and then we can run water set on top of it. And then we obtain these water set lines that we can then impose on the original um, image and separate at least those um, objects that are more or less rounded. Okay, so this is something that you can uh, sometimes uh, found as distance transform uh, water set. Okay. And again, I want you to keep this in mind to see that okay, uh, having a distance uh, representation from our objects to the borders can also help the, the post process. So we have a plan. We have one way of doing the first small, um, or solving the first small uh, problem, okay? With a unit-like model in 2D or 3D, depending on our data, we get object probabilities, and then hopefully they are good enough so we can do post-processing with either connected components or uh, the water set algorithm. Okay, so if we want to apply this to a very large uh, data set, what do we have to do? Well, we make patches of our data set, we apply the segmentation uh, network to the patches, and then in the second step, we undo the patches, we put them together. The, the things that are overlapping, they could be, uh, imagine here, uh, mitochondria will continue here, hopefully. And then we can run on top of this our extraction method. Hopefully, the extraction method can fit 
the, the, the whole data set into memory. Otherwise, uh, we may need an implementation that is able to also uh, run in, in, in parallel. What is the problem of this uh, pipeline? Well, the problem is maybe a bottleneck no? that I mentioned before, is that we may be too sensitive to the, um, to the object predictions. If we don't have nice object predictions here, we may end up with mergers and splits, as I mentioned in uh, a few slides ago. Okay. So can we help the post-processing uh, somehow? Yes, we can. Uh, actually, there was a, a paper a few years back where they said, okay, we get splits or artifacts, that's okay, because they're more or less easy to correct in a proofreading uh, part, even automatically the artifacts with some morphological operations, we can get rid of them. And a splits is easy for a human to click, click, click and put, put them together. But if we get mergers, it's really a pain because especially in 3D, if we merge two objects together, then we have to start selecting how to cut them in 3D. So this is something that we should uh, work on before. And the idea that they propose is to, as I said before, create a model, a deep model, that not only provides object probabilities, but also provides border uh, probabilities. It's, so it's a multitask uh, network or with a multitask loss that does uh, both things. And also with some weights in, in, in this uh, paper, they say, okay, let's, let's put some weights on the regions that are more important that maybe if two uh, objects are touching each other uh, too closely, let's insist that the model provides a border there. So in, in our pipeline, this is easy to do. We just need to incorporate here a new output. So the model does object probability detection or object probability prediction and boundary probability prediction. Okay, And then we continue the same way. Can we do even better than this? Actually, this is one of the ideas behind uh, the Stardust project that uh, came up uh, a year later, where they also were trying to identify uh, the most common uh, sources of mistakes, no? in, in especially when doing cell segmentation, nuclear segmentations, that are uh, very common problems in bioimage analysis. And they say, okay, usually we have problems with noisy images, uh, but also with crowded uh, objects, no? when they are uh, touching each other and they are a bit noisy, the borders are not that clear. If we do something like a regular unit for semantic segmentation, we, we end up with, with uh, tons of mergers. And if we try to do this with uh, even something like a bounding box based method, like a mask RCNN, since the bounding boxes overlap so much, they are considered the same object anyway. Okay. So the solution that they came up with is what they call uh, star convex cell priors, okay, or star disk. And the idea is also to provide a network that does not only object probabilities, but also provides uh, an idea of the boundary locations using radial distances from the center of the objects to the, uh, to the borders of those objects, okay? So together with all these rays, they produce what they call an overcomplete set of candidate uh, polygons. So basically we have a network that it could be uh, any network that uh, with uh, the shape of, of the unit or a, a classic network that produces several outputs. Okay, we will see object probabilities and a representation of those distances. And then in the post-processing out of those uh, rays, we create the polygons and take the most uh, probable ones. Let's see an example. We get an input image like this. Again, it's very noisy. Plenty of uh, cells are touching each other. So it's, it's quite a difficult uh, problem. And then this model is going to provide us with the object probabilities of every single cell or nuclear or, or whatever it is. And then we have uh, more um, output channels, one per distance to the border, okay, once per ray. This is a, a parameter in the algorithm. As many rays, uh, the more rays we use, well, the 
the better defined is the, the polygon, but it requires uh, more parameters and more training. Okay, so we can get different directions that we can combine together and then produce a set of polygon proposals. Okay. In the end, we get usual, usually a bunch of um, polygon proposals per object. So we have to do a, a, a small um, post-processing that is called uh, non-maximum suppression to get just the most likely one for every single object, okay? based on overlap as well. And then they produce uh, nicely uh, done instance segmentation results. A couple of years later, they came up with a, a version in 3D. The idea is exactly the same, but instead of having this star convex uh, priors in 2D, they do it in 3D, and also the object probabilities are produced in, in 3D. So the network is a 3D network, but it works exactly the same. So it's very nice. It's actually competitive with things like the mask RCNN, but with many less parameters. Remember, I, I told you the, the mask RCNN is quite a monstrous uh, network in, in for, for, for these standards. But this approach has a, a small problem. That is that, OK, these um, arrays are only well-defined for pixels that are contained within the object, meaning that it only works for convex objects. Okay? Only convex objects can be segmented. OK, it's, it's a problem if we don't work with things like um, like cells or mitochondria that are usually convex, no? potato-like, blob-like uh, structures. Otherwise, this is a, a very great solution. Can we do better? Well, this is the idea from uh, CellPose, the other state of the art uh, algorithm. That's actually called a generalist cellular segmentation algorithm. They say, OK, look, not all cells, they look like blobs. So, we're going to propose another idea instead of these rays to simulate uh, these distances. They actually uh, simulate what they call a smooth topological map. So from the mm, manual bo annotated border of the cells, they simulate uh, a diffusion from the center that can be represented with the spatial gradients in X and Y. Okay? Actually, this later can be represented in a normalized direction from 0 to 360 okay, in, a, in this very colorful uh, way. And this works not only for blob-like objects, but for all kind of shaped um, cells or whatever object you want to, to segment. So it's more adaptable to all kinds of shapes. The whole idea is, uh, in the end, quite similar. They have a neural network. In this case, it's in 2D. Okay, and the, the outputs of the network are the this uh, flows in X and Y, these gradients in X and Y, and also the cell probabilities. Well, this is cell pose, so this they, they will focus on segmenting cells. And combining these three outputs, they can get this flow field. And then once they got this, the extracting the instances is almost automatic. What they do is for every pixel, they check to which uh, pixel it, it converges. And if pixels converge into the same uh, pixel, they're assigned to the same label. Okay, So they, they get the individual mask like this. They propose uh, an architecture that is also, again, a unit-like architecture. It has um, residual blocks. You know, in, the, in every level, they double the number of uh, convolutional layers. And also have some uh, peculiarities. Well, for example, uh, they they say, okay, um, they, they're trying to, to be generalist. So they say, if the, if the images have the same style, the same appearance, they should be following the same path. So to keep, to enforce that in the decoder, they, they do some global average pooling where they say, okay, they claim to have the style of the, of, of the um, feature maps and they pass that through the uh, rest of the, of the network. In any case, uh, the, the main idea is to use this multiple representation in the output and then perform this uh, post-processing. And how do we enforce uh, generalization? Well, uh, 
there's no uh, an easy way to do this. So the approach was to use a very generic, uh, yeah, generalist, let's say, data set. A data set that included uh, many types of image modalities, uh, different types of, of cells, from fluorescence, bright field, many modalities. And also non-microscopy images of things like this, that they were uh, repeated objects that were touching each other, like fruit, uh, jellyfish, rocks, shells, uh, etc. Okay. Uh, it works very nicely, as, as you will see. And for 3D, well, they propose a solution that is uh, applying the 2D network in the, in the other uh, uh, 3D planes. So you train only in 2D annotations in X and Y, and then you have a block, let's say, for example, the, the mitochondria one, you can apply to the CX plane and the ZY plane. So you, you obtain the probabilities and the flows on those uh, directions. So you have six different um, gradients that you can combine together into a 3D flow image. So you can post-process uh, the same way. Okay, <clears throat> so uh, to finish, uh, we can uh, learn from these ideas and uh, in our um, generalist uh, framework, we can say, okay, why don't we do uh, a similar thing with a generic 2D, 3D pipeline? Well, we add one more um, output to the network, which is uh, the distance map, okay? because it seems that it's, it's important. The distance map, Actually, it's generic. It doesn't have to be a flow or a ray or anything like this, right? So we have exactly the same uh, model, but with three outputs. So we have a multitask uh, network, and then we can combine them to do um, the final instance segmentation. And this is the key. How do we combine these three images into this one? Well, the idea is very simple uh, by using Waterset because we can use uh, there's a version of Waterset that we can use with the mask and with, uh, as we said before, imposed markers. Let's say these are my predictions. Okay? For simplicity, I put them in, in 2D. We have the object um, probabilities, the borders, and the distance map. Okay? So we can threshold the object probabilities to get a mass, maximum mask to which we can uh, raise the waters, okay? We can use a medium high object probability to get a top of, of um, where they can uh, flood. And then we need markers. So for the markers, we can combine these two. We have, uh, we use a very high probability here. We just get the centers of the objects, as I said before. And then to make sure we separate those um, that are touching each other, we can threshold this and use it to, uh, to prevent these guys to touch each other. Okay, so we get one marker per cell. And then we can run this on top of, again, the distance. As, as we said, we use the distance. We have mountains on top of the objects we want holes. So we get the negative uh, distance. And we can take this tree, run the water set on this image with these markers, with this as top. Um, have limit of the of the water set algorithm, and we get nice uh, instance segmentation. Okay. So just to, to finish with this part, I'll leave you here um, a bunch of uh, open source frameworks where you can do this. Of course, the ones from Stardist and Cellpost that are very uh, powerful and popular. In Cellpost, you also can uh, play a little bit online with their model, which is very nice. And then I, I, I want to mention these last two because I, one is from us and one is from uh, some collaborators. We work on, on electron microscopy. We have one based on, on PyTorch for connectomics. It's called like this. And uh, with a, my PhD student, uh, Danny Franco, we are developing uh, a set of bioimage analysis pipelines in TensorFlow we can do 2D and 3D, semantic segmentation, distance segmentation, detection, and uh, classification. Okay. You need data or uh, more or less big data to, to play with. Um, I want to 
emphasize that we release some large data set with some uh, collaborators, on, not only on EM, this is for mitochondrial segmentation, we have also nucleus segmentation in EM and uh, micro CT, we have uh, axon segmentation and we have more and more data set that you can uh, play with and also compare yourself with because there are uh, open challenges to do this. <clears throat> 